Okay, I think we'll start since I know everybody wants to hear the speakers and then go back and look at the art. So I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and on behalf of the Architectural League, I'd like to welcome you to the first of two evenings of lectures by winners of the annual Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers. Tonight's lecture is being live streamed and will also be archived on the League's site. We're privileged to once again be holding the exhibition and lectures at Parsons School of Design at the New School. It's an outstanding program partnership in a great many ways, including the combined expertise of Daniel Chu, Daisy Wong, Christina Kaufman, and Radhika Sabramian of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center. And we'd also like to thank Brian McGrath and Robert Kirkbride of the School of Constructed Environments, who once again helped us with all sorts of exhibition logistics like storage, which is a big thing in New York City, as it turns out. Um, the funding that makes this program possible comes from longtime League Prize supporters, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, and Tischler and Son, as well as a new sponsor, USAI Lighting, and alumni of both the League Prize and Emerging Voices programs who have contributed to the League's Next Generation Fund. League programs are also made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. A quick word about the competition itself, although, I mean, there's so many people here who are past winners or people who've been involved, you probably can recite this at this point. But anyway, it's open to architects and designers 10 years or less out of undergraduate or graduate school. That's an important point. Young isn't an age, it's where you are in your career. So we've had winners at every age range from their late 20s to what at the time seemed very old to me, a 50-year-old winner. Um, but anyway, as you can even see from tonight, there are people at different points um, in their careers, but all sort of using that as a starting point from um, their education and development. Entrants are required to respond to a competition theme that means in tandem with compiling their portfolio, entrants are called to step back and review their work in relationship to it and identify the underlying and unifying meaning of the work they've been doing. Um, we think that's a really important opportunity, something that maybe you haven't had to do since school to have to think about your work more cohesively as opposed to just getting each project out, um, usually on a very tight deadline. Um, the theme is developed by the League Prize Committee, and it changes every year to reflect current issues in architectural design and theory. And the committee is a group selected yearly from past League Prize winners, and they also ask me prominent members of the design community to serve with them on the jury. I'd like to thank this year's committee members, Jason Austin, Roche Espinosa, and Gerald Bodziak, and Gerald will speak more about this year's theme and introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Anne. Um, on behalf of the Architectural League of New York and the Architectural League Prize Committee, we welcome you to the first evening of lectures by winners of the 2016 Architectural League Prize. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at Parsons, the new School of Design, for co-sponsoring and continuing to host the League Prize uh, exhibition and lectures. Um, I would also like to thank Anne Rieselbach and Rosalie Ginevro and the Architectural League for their continued support of young architects and for providing a forum for designers at all points in their career. The members of the Young Architects and Designers Committee uh, comprised of me, Jason Austin, and Riche Espinoza uh, chose the theme impermanence in order to address the question of time in the production of contemporary architectural work, notably that of, young, of the young designer intended to provoke applicants to consider the form and meaning of ephemerality and permanence. The theme also tackled current aspects of society, economy, and policy. The Young Architects Committee jury, uh, composed of Mimi Hong, Paul Lewis, and Anu uh, Mather, spent a long day in the spring reviewing and evaluating each submission. After sorting through 97 portfolios that range from exceptional, uh, to the wonderfully strange and the utterly confounding, wherein each applicant demonstrated how the dimension of time is addressed in their body of work. Uh, we arrived at six finals for this year's League Prize, three of which we'll be presenting this evening, Design Earth, Open Office, and uh, Peltier de Fontenay. Uh, while the six firms work divergent focus and approach, all posit a distinct personal outlook on the question of architectural permanence and um, um, mutability. In a time of shifting ecologies, turbulent economies, uh, communities in need, and expanding technologies. Uh, 
The first practice presenting tonight is Design Earth, led by Rania Gojan and El Hadi Jazairi. Founded in 2012, Design Earth is a research intensive practice based in Michigan and Massachusetts. Rania is an assistant professor at MIT School of Architecture and Planning and holds a Doctor of Design from Harvard University, a Master in Geography from University College London, and a Bachelor of Architecture from American University of Beirut. El Hadi is currently an assistant professor of architecture at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan and holds a doctorate of design from Harvard University, a master of architecture from Cornell University, and a bachelor of architecture from La Cambra in Brussels. Design Earth's submission touched on an important aspect of this year's theme. Their text begins, to live in an epoch that is shaped by extensive environmental transformations is to be confronted with risks and uncertainty at the scale of the planet. Using what they call geostories, they see their work as the practice of making geographies, which involves representation, translation, and remaking. We welcome Rania and El Hadi. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. We are Rania Gosun and El Hadi Jazari, and we're partners of Design Earth. And it's a pleasure and honor to be here for the Architecture League Prize tonight. Uh, a long list of gratitude, but to name a few um, that made tonight possible for us, the Architecture League team and everyone involved in this year's cycle, uh, the students, colleagues, and staff at our respective universities, at the University of Michigan and at MIT, uh, our long-term collaborator, Luke Bullman, for many wonderful collaborations, the editors and curators who gave our work a home, at different institutions, and above all, the fantastic uh, team of Design Earth collaborators. So thank you. This evening, we want to think with you through some of the issues that we have been engaged in over the last few years. In Homo Geographicus, Robert Sack notes that we are geographical beings transforming the Earth and making it into a home, and adds that that transformed world affects who we are. He adds that the consequences of our geographical agency are more pressing because we are now geographical leviathans. Such large transformation of the earth is often unaccounted for in urban and environmental discourse, both worldviews that divide nature and the city into two distinct and essentialized domains to later reunite them in a rigid symmetry, such as the image in this frame, for example, that features a polar landform on one hand reflecting into the all iconic, all lights Manhattan skyline. In the process, the geographies of urban infrastructures, those that connect both views, are flattened into a thin line. And when geography is made not to matter, the urban is cast in a representational lineage of Manhattanisms and the environment in that of wilderness. Such designed abstraction is a powerful tool to abstract geography in the urban and environmental imaginations. In this process, it does a few things. One, it abstracts the materialities of these systems their dimensions, their attributes, their nodes, limits. Second, it leaves out the associated transformations of the territory that follow the deployment of such environmental technologies. And third, it does not attend to the politics of consensus or dissensus in how to organize the world and distribute its resources. So when geography is reduced to a thin line, the city is detached from the urban process. Indeed, some would argue that the mandate for clean urbanism has rested on the cities reaching out for both resources and its waste disposal to political and geographical entities well beyond its jurisdictions, all while divesting itself of the associated environmental course of urbanization, or what is referred to as an externality field. So how can we think of the earth beyond such binaries? The historical significance of our contemporary ecological crisis might stem from the impossibility of continuing to imagine an outside in which the unwanted consequences of our collective actions could be allowed to linger and disappear from view. There's no zone of reality in which we could casually rid ourselves of the consequences of human, political, industrial, and economic life. And if urbanism has served to abstract the spatial and political relations of such urbanism, could geography as a paradigm, a representational practice, and an aesthetic project expand the scale of the urban to account for the earth and bring it to the domain of public and disciplinary controversies? So design earth is concerned with such relationships between geography and design. The practice engages the geographies of technological systems to open up aesthetic and political concerns for architecture and urbanism. 
It's a representational and speculative practice, which by making visible and formal, counters abstractions of space. The practice, that's that of geography, involves both writing about the world and also representing it and writing it again and marking a new world in the process. So this is part of the larger effort that we were engaged in as founding editors of New Geographies. The, response was, the journal was born in response to a condition in which designers were increasingly uh, um, compelled to transform larger contexts and address issues that were previously confined to other disciplines. Such has prompted designers to re-examine the tools and play the synthesis role that geography had aspired to play between the physical, the economic, and the representational. Volume, new of, volume two of New Geographies, Landscapes of Energy, the one that I've edited, historicizes and materializes the relations of energy and space. It maps some of the physical, social, and representational geographies of oil in particular, and by making visible this infrastructure, it's an invitation to articulate design's environmental agency and its possible scales of intervention. The issue four, Scales of the Earth, which El Hadi has edited, interrogates how the new geography from above, the scale of vision, viewpoint, and qualification of space that is made possible by satellite imagery, reframes many contemporary debates on design, agency, and territory. <clears throat> so how do we make sense of the Earth at the moment in which it's presented in crisis or in impermanence? To live in, ap in an epoch that is shaped by extensive environmental transformation is to be confronted with risks and, un and uncertainties at the scale of the planet. Paradoxically, we remain so little mobilized, in part because of our failures to comprehend the scale of a story that is difficult both to tell and to hear. Geo Stories outlines a manifesto on the environmental imagination through the medium of the architectural project. The prefix, geo, engages the earth as a grand question of design making formal the unaccounted for spaces of environmental externalities. The suffix, stories, channels such matters which are difficult into geographic fictions on technological systems. Currently a manuscript awaiting for a, pr for a publishing press, GeoStories assembles the last six years of design or speculative projects that address the environment as a matter of concern. <laughs> These projects render sensible the dimensions of our world and through geographic fiction invite the reader to understand the earth and humanity's relation to it. It makes visible <coughs> the unaccounted for spaces of technological externalities, such landscapes of logistics, resource extraction, trash, space debris, etc., in speculative scenarios on these systems. And in the process, these cautionary tales highlight the political and ethical implications of our impermanent earth, all while imagining fantastic architectural survival and adaptation strategies. So I'll share snippets of a couple of projects before delving into the longer, kind of the, 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 the projects that uh, took a longer time to complete. So the first of these is 4.7, a geographic stroll around the horizon. This project counters the abstraction of the sea into a logistical zone of offshore oil by expanding the spatial and cognitive imaginary of Rio de Janeiro to its ocean hinterland. The project draws on the horizon, which is set at 4.7 kilometers for a person standing on the surface of the earth, as a geographic aesthetic that rendered legible the offshore project. So the project reclaims the political consciousness of the ocean, which is usually well beyond that of urban life, by projecting a constellation of Rio's um, most iconic 10 sites between the coast and the oil offshore. These iconic sites are projected into a linear archipelago so that the distances between an island and the next extends the limits of the perceivable. And that distance varies depending on the height of every island. Eventually, the Samba Drome, the Corcovado, the Sugarloaf, and the Rio Aqueduct <coughs> lead you to the last platform in the Siri, which is the oil Petrobas platform. Another project, Belly of a Mountain, privileges the section of the earth as a geographic worldview and a discourse which is often dominated by surface mappings. The project incorporates and kind of swallows the banished externalities of Rio de Janeiro into the site of its most iconic landform. It collapses the space of the nature preserve and that of the toxic zone. So the mountain takes in within its belly the cemeteries, the water purification plants, and other, and other facilities that process gray and dead matter and turn them into fertilizers, purified air, and that thin green shell. So th this, these snippets of the project might help inform the, our recent publication in which our two research agendas, Landscapes of Energy and Scales of the Earth, came neatly together. And the book is entitled Geographies of Trash. 
The book, I'll not, I will not delve into the details of this, this specific project in the book, but I'll give you an overview and uh, hopefully use the book to outline the public dimension of our work. So in the age of the environment, the logistics of trash have expanded to the planetary scale, all while being relegated to invisibility as matter out of place. This book was honored with the 2014 ACSA Faculty Design Award, and it reclaims the forms, the technologies, and politics of trash system within urbanism. The design research methodology adopts a threefold approach, uh, the th and that neatly maps into the sections of the book. It charts the relations of trash and space across different scales, from that of the block to the township, the territorial grid, across state and continental flows. Second, it proposes five situated yet generic architectural strategies that engage alternative imaginaries for practices of landfilling, recycling, burning, reusing, dumping, and in the process generally valuing matter. And third, it assembles and it seeks to bring out the spaces of trash into disciplinary and public controversies. So the, the five projects in the book are entitled CAP, Collect, Contain, Preserve, and Form. And how do they come together? They come together in a few formats, one of which is the book. Uh, another format is a six by six by six feet cube installation, which collects these projects into an object in space. Every side of the cube represents a, ter a territory of a Michigan township, and it features a satellite image of the project's general vicinity, which is printed on acrylic, an aluminum etching of the project's specific site, and a yellow resin cast model of each of the proposed projects. And in that, the project aspires to shift some of the public debate from what Bruno Latour would call matters of fact to matters of concerns, from things that are solidified into <coughs> technological <coughs> solutions to venues that open up the domain of questions and relevant concerns. And that by wrapping up the urban process in these environmental externalities that inevitably always accompany it. Um, maybe a further distinction because such is very relevant into the rest of our work between matters of fact and matters of concern. Matters of fact insist that the response to a garbage crisis, for example, is to continue to keep it out of sight. The process is that of managing its disappearance. Matters of concern, on the other hand, accept that urbanization will continue to create issues that we must address in its totality. A matter of concern, Bruno Latour explained, is what happens to a matter of fact when you add to it its whole scenography, much like you would do by shifting your attention from the stage to the whole machinery of a theater. And this is the modality that we're exploring in the forthcoming uh, contribution to the two 2016 Lisbon Architectural Triennale. The Diorama of Trash assembles again these five projects into a two by five meter monumental panorama. From the Greek, geo, the earth, and rama, spectacle, this georama, or spectacle of the earth, or theater of the world, makes public the issue of waste management. And by virtue of this large-scale drawing, it immerses the spectator into the spaces of technological system in the purpose of stimulating a geographic imaginations on issues that tend to often be out of place. <coughs> Uh, Neck of the Moon, the project currently on display in the gallery, is the culminating work in the GeoStories uh, series. It has received the first prize from the Jacques Rougerie Foundation in a sequence of nine drawings, a video, and the accompanying two Cosmograms publication. Neck of the Moon invites you to imagine a world in which compacted sparse trash grows into a planet, the planet Laika, the Earth Cyborg Second Moon. From the 1966 Life magazine photo essay, Planet Earth by Dawn's Early Light, the final photograph of the series from the Gemini 10 shuttle shows a single trash bag floating in space, a bag which contained objects that NASA intended to leave behind before the mission's return flight to Earth. At over a million feet above the planet's surface, the plastic bag seemed categorically unrelated to trash on Earth. Yet, the short essay that closed the article alerted readers to the growing clutter of space trash, arguing that the more than 1,200 large objects in orbit could someday become a serious traffic problem in space. As the editors of Life observed, 
Just as cities had become clogged with animal waste and garbage, space trash could eventually become one day the proper concern of extraterrestrial street cleaners. In 2010, NASA reiterates the concern. Indeed, orbital debris poses a risk to continued reliable use of space-based services and operations uh, and to the safety of persons as well as properties in space and on Earth. Such material byproducts of the space age, such as decommissioned satellite and fragments from rockets, pose collision risks with operational space objects. The issue is especially significant is in geostationary orbits where satellites and space debris share the same orbital path and will continue circling around the Earth for centuries. The risk will also become more significant as new satellites are launched at a growing rate of 100 per year. Neck of the Moon, the project cleans up the orbital environment by compacting targeted space debris into a new satellite planet that orbits the Earth. A large tug with a robotic arm compacts large object at high altitude into a planet Laika, the Earth's second moon. The new planet eventually shares with its namesake a stray dog that was the first creature to orbit the Earth, Laika, a vital role in humanity's journey into space. The project articulates cosmic, topographic, climatic, and vegetal features of the Earth. An umbilical line ties Laika to the belly of the Cotopaxi volcano in Ecuador. The cord-like space elevator connects the newly formed planet and supplies it with material from the Earth. It also beams the solar energy captured by Laika in space back to Earth. The space elevator ducks into the crater of the volcano, the Cotopaxi volcano. Cotopaxi had already impressed the geographer Alexander von Humboldt in his 19th century travel to tropical America. He wrote, we may consider this colossal mountain as one of those eternal monuments by which nature has marked the great divisions of the terrestrial globe. For many years, the world's high, highest active volcano, Cotopaxi presents itself as an isolated cone covered with snow from all perspectives. Its name, Cotopaxi, in Quechua origin and Inca language still being spoken among the Indian of the Andes also means neck of the moon. During a full moon, the volcano crater appears to be holding the earth. It is not with rockets, Sputniks, or missiles that modern man will achieve the conquest of space, observed Yves Klein. It is by means of the powerful yet peaceful force of his sensitivity that man will inhabit space. Beyond the generic term of, for the satellites, for the Russian satellites, Sputnik also refers to a traveling companion or a fellow traveler, and so does Neck of the Moon, exploring what it means for us fellow travelers to be embodied in these cyborg space junk worlds. The two Cosmograms pamphlets brings together Neck of the Moon and a fellow cosmographic project, Love Your Monsters. At the dawn of the space age, the whole Earth had presented a world picture that was global and ecological, all while staging Earth as a standalone globe, detached from outer space. But we do not live on a blue marble. Insofar, as that image of the planet symbolizes an objective, holistic, impersonal Earth made visible by our technology, our achievements. In an epoch of extensive anthropogenic transformations 
and extraplanetary geographies, um, those it has become crucial from a legal and political point of view to expand the geographical imagination of the world and to uh, go beyond the Earth. The two projects in this pamphlet engage such architectural imagination, that of the cosmos, by drawing together a physical geography of the Earth as well as the, the, the geography of outer space. The cosmic nebulae, the artificial satellites, the space debris, as well as the planets. There are a few copies in the gallery if you want to grab one. If you are watching this online, email us <laughs> on how to get your copy. <laughs> After oil is our contribution to the Venice Biennale Kuwait Pavilion in a series of nine drawings and three models, the three speculative projects join a discussion to imagine and reinvent the urban landscape of the Pan Gulf region. After all, it proposes three speculative tales that explore the geography of the Persian Gulf and its islands in the decades after oil. These stories are also a reflection on the present condition. They stage and extrapolate critical issues to today's oil landscape to make the public aware of the energy systems on which modern life is dependent, as well as the long-term consequences of current fuel, fossil fuel regimes. The projects chart matters of concern, as Rania pointed out, for sites of extraction, sites of trans transit logistics, as well as the slow violence of climate change. Sites of logistics and sites of extraction. Thus, Ireland is the major offshore Emirati oil and gas industrial facility. Since the first expedition in 1953, the island has fueled the urbanization of Dubai and Abu Dhabi, with many of the country's iconic buildings built from oil wealth. Thus, crude make visible such displacement of value in oil urbanism by imagining the island in relation to a subsurface field of depleted oil reservoirs. UAE's architectural landmarks are indexed in the relation to the geological depth and times of extraction. You can see here Burj Khalifa at the bottom of the image that corresponds to the latest phases of extraction. The volume of excavated soil and stone is assembled into an artificial mountain on the surface of the island, a landform monument to the age of oil. The Strait of Hormuz is a critical oil transit choke point with 20% of world oil trade moving across 34 mile wide passage. The strait has never actually been shut down in spite of a persistent Geo geopolitical anxiety over territorial disputes, notably the disagreement between UAE and Iran over three islands, Abu Musa, Great Tump, Lesser Tump Island. So here the project, the Grand Chessboard, repurposes the strait into a real estate territorial game that is financed by the oil futures of the traditional adversaries across the Gulf. The game board absorbs the three islands among the different chess pieces of iconic speculative urban projects. Iran gets the black pieces and Saudi Arabia gets the, black one, the white ones. The end of the Persian Gulf War in 1991 was accompanied with what is considered the world largest oil spill, which drastically affected Kuwait's coastal environment. Beyond the apocalyptic intensity of such geotraumatic event, the everyday business as usual oil industry with its increasing rates of carbon emissions puts the world through a slow, much slower violence in the form of anthropogenic climate change. 
the flat Bubian Island is one vulnerable landscape to sea level rise. So this is Bubian Island after sea level rise. There once was an island there. The project gave form to such invisible threats. It redraws the island's shrinking shoreline as its highest 16 elevated mounts that are stabilized in an archipelago of Edenic islands. Collectively, this is the image from the Venice Biennale, after oil renders visible the embeddedness of the oil system in the region and invites us to imagine the long-term consequences of such crude relationship between earth and urbanization. A time when the triad of energy, economy, and environment is at the forefront of design concerns, such a critical position is important to avoid that green or clean urbanism purges once again dirty matters of geography. So the last project that we're sharing this evening is entitled uh, Pacific Aquarium, and this is work in progress for the forthcoming uh, Oslo Triennale. The F Pacific Aquarium portrays the overlapping concerns of ecology and economy in the Pacific Ocean, where the projected one million square meters of deep sea mining in the clarion Clipperton zone would constitute the greatest footprint of human activity in, is, in what is considered the largest continuous ecological unit. The project brings together the currently proposed nine zones of ecological interest, as the dotted squares as you can see them on the map. Roughly this is the scale of the United States, although you, you can probably see the scale here. And the project has, um, uh, along with the um, territorial concessions, a proposal for nine squares which neatly sit away from the concessions and are uh, separate from each other. So our proposal brings these projects together and consolidates them into one zone that is overlaid onto the extractive operational landscape. So we're bringing the concerns of political ecology into the zones of operation rather than adjacent to the zones of operation. And again, we will not go into the details of each of the nine proposed projects, but there's a series of nine projects which each constructs a geographic fiction of a world in which the externalities of resource exploitation and climate change are weaved into spatial scales, temporalities, and species beyond the human. The attitude of the project is one that is uh, nauseated by an environmentalist shade of bright green, in response to which the drawings explore the possibilities of an ecological aesthetics that builds on, the sur on surrealism as the procedure of using violence against unexplicated cultural relation. Such dark ecology, as Timothy Morton refers to it, puts hesitation, uncertainty, irony, and thoughtfulness back into ecological thinking. The project appropriates the object of the aquarium for its installation and that to take aim at this abysmal distance between our selfish economic worries and the great scales of the earth. The aquarium channels our sense of wonder to stage environmental externalities as an intimate part, almost a domestic part, of the political constituency of the earth. Collectively, these nine aquariums reclaim the production of the ocean into public controversies by connecting political ecologies with speculative design and a collective aesthetic experience. In its practice, to conclude, Design Earth seeks to flip Manhattanism on its head, both the urban grid and the dome over it. It seeks a geographic sensibility which prompts us to think further about the design of such things at scale as scale, environment, and territory. But above all, it elicits us to intervene within power and its representations in ways that actually make a difference. The challenge of a geographic ethics is thus not to simply represent these systems, but to intervene in them so as to render visible the inequality between a distribution of spaces and time and a distribution of capacities and power. Thank you. Um, okay, so the uh, second presentation this evening features the work of Niraj Bhatia, an architect and urban designer who founded uh, the Open Workshop in San Francisco in 2011. His work includes design projects as well as writing and editing. In addition to his practice, he is an assistant professor of architecture at the California College of the Arts, where he is currently the co-chair of the Urban Works Agency, a group within CCA taking on urbanistic issues 
such as San Francisco's housing crisis through projects, exhibitions, public events, and publications. Niraj holds a Master of Architecture and Urban Design degree from MIT and both a Bachelor of Architecture and a Bachelor of, Ar of Environmental Studies degree from the University of Waterloo. In his submission, he presented, quote, projects that examine how the human and environmental subjects and their individual transforming, ephemeral, and often contradictory characteristics continuously recompose a permanent work. He describes his architecture as a kind of collective framework that foregrounds the richness of a dynamic subject. We welcome Niraj. So thank you, Gerald, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to Anne and Matt for organizing everything this week. I know there was a lot of uh, choreography and you guys have been doing the last few months, so thank you. And uh, thank you to Jonathan Massey, who I'm very happy is here today, and his support, as well as CCA support uh, for uh, everything my office has been doing. Um, I also want to thank uh, some amazing people I've had. I've uh, been very fortunate to work with in these past years in San Francisco, including Cesar Lopez, uh, Sean Comlos, uh, Jeremy Jacinth, Haifa El Guaz, uh, Bella Mang, as well as Blake Stevenson. Um, I'm just going to adjust this up a bit. It is a little awkward. You're right. <laughs> um, let, me, let me start by saying that I think today architecture is having a disciplinary identity crisis. Um, I think the discipline traditionally has really done really well uh, with thinking through uh, determinancy, permanence, and form, with the role of the architect being to determine these lines that order the natural and social world. And this disciplinary need to control uh, neglects, for the most part, the evolving and transforming qualities of the natural environment. And today we are much more aware of the futility in attempting to control the natural environment, requiring architecture to engage in transformation, adaptation, and ultimately time. At the same time, with the rise and embrace of pluralism and the diversity that pluralism brings being the core of the public sphere, we see that the subject of design is also expanding. No longer the masses, architecture is confronted with divergent subjects and their individual values that are often irreconcilable or controllable. So how do these divergent, transforming, and impermanent variables in our natural and political world interface with architecture? And this becomes a question of where design and designers should exert control and where it can allow for choice, flexibility, and transformation. And, and this tension uh, is not new. I think uh, it emerged probably between the Enlightenment and Romanticism and more forcefully in the 1960s, um, where several different approaches of looking at where to exert control or lack thereof, you know, ant farm being sort of on one end of the spectrum where very little control was exerted. So uh, my office is dedicated to situating design at the edge of this tension, the edge between determinancy and indeterminacy, form and atmosphere, permanence and impermanence. We are very influenced by the possibilities presented by the theoretical construct posited by Umberto Eco in 1962, entitled The Open Work, which positions the designer as a form of choreographer. Eco, uh, for those of you who haven't had the chance to read uh, his treaties, um, he characterizes various works of art, particularly poetry, film, and music, as either closed or open, depending on the relationship crafted between the subject, which is the viewer of the piece, the object, the work of art, and the author, the artist. For Echo, the closed conception was one where the artwork uh, was interpreted by the subject exactly how the artist wanted them to see it in a singular manner. In contrast to the closed work, Echo speaks of the emergence of the open work, a work that has been strategically designed by the author to have a degree of openness, allowing each individual subject to project the final missing pieces to complete the work. And while the open work allowed for the possibility of numerous personal experiences and interventions, it still maintained its status as a work through being framed within, quote, a world intended by the author. So design determinism or precision was not lost in this equation. From the musical compositions of Stockhausen and Boulez to metaphors of Kafka and puns by Joyce, the open work inserted the subject as an active agent in the production of the work. 
So Echo uh, doesn't talk about architecture um, in his book, but if, if we were to apply this uh, concept to architecture, landscape architecture, or infrastructural design, the open work would, I contend, require an expansion of the subject to also include the environmental context or site, which is part of every architectural project. The power of Echo's concept is in that it allows for the simultaneity of an underlying order and an openness for indeterminate acts. Therefore, the open work holds much promise for addressing one of the most complex uh, contemporary design issues, political and environmental indeterminacy. So I'm going to present uh, four approaches today with uh, associated projects to unpack this tension between permanence and impermanence. And I should mention that this list is not uh, scientific. It's post-rationalized as I put the portfolio together. And, and I think also these four themes are just the start. I, I think there's many more uh, to develop over one's career. Um, and also, when I present these works, I'm not going to be presenting them holistically. I'll actually just be zooming in on very specific components of them uh, to illustrate the point. Um, the first category is what I've termed frameworks. These are structures that accommodate and engage indeterminate and evolving subjects. These fluctuating subjects are able to transform, adapt, or occupy these structures in novel ways. And typically operating through a negotiation of illegible geometric primitive and flexible field conditions, these structures are brought to life through framing and indexing impermanent ephemeral subjects. So the project I'll show is one for a very small play structure in Oakland where, similar to a food desert, there is a play desert. So uh, this project is called Scaffoldia, um, and we typically think of scaffolding as a temporary element in service of constructing a more permanent structure. And for this project, we really wanted to ask uh, what if scaffolding itself was the primary structure that instead of supporting the construction of permanent artifacts, incited temporal forms of occupation? How can residents take control of structures and reappropriate them to play on top of, within, and inside? So this is a, a play structure that originates from very, two very simple monumental archi architectural forms that for us embody an outward space conception and an inward space conception, that of the pyramid and the dome. And hybridizing these forms, the project transforms the poche space into an occupiable lattice. This creates a very simple three-dimensional object that allows for engagement on top of and below and within. So moving between interior and exterior, these shapes allow for different relationships with the human body, whether sitting or climbing or hanging. Uh, we saw a numerous number of things happen um, without prescribing a singular way to interact with the project. So for us as a play structure, what's interesting about play and the whole lineage and history of, of architects that have looked at play and the politics of play is that it's really about curiosity, uh, vulnerability, and openness. And the project uh, you know, asks you how to form a unique relationship to it. And what was really interesting to see uh, for us, you, know, you kind of put something out in the world and then see how people respond to it, was that um, adults who used it that typically stayed on the exterior of the, the form uh, felt very vulnerable climbing this thing. And that act of feeling vulnerable uh, made them laugh at themselves. And it made them more comfortable talking to other people around them. And we thought that was a very kind of powerful moment where, uh, you know, in that moment where you're confronted with falling through a structure, everyone is able to talk to each other um, and, and with strangers. So here, control is really exerted on the production of a form that enables numerous forms of engagement with the human body. Uh, the subject here is framed, but not limited. The second category of projects and, and you'll notice I'm just showing a couple slides of other projects and then focusing on one in more detail. Um, the second category falls into what I'm terming are the articulated surface. The flexibility of the generic surface has positioned it as the primary typology to organize various forms of temporal processes. The articulated surface tests how the time-based management of impermanent processes can more fully choreograph difference, expression, identity, and the scale of human uses and or the transforming environment reducing the abstraction between the subject and their larger context. So uh, this project was a response to the widespread impact felt on Long Island and other areas surrounding New York from Hurricane Sandy. It's actually quite a large uh, urban design uh, proposal for 1,500 new houses in Far Rockaway. Um, many of you have probably seen this in person. This is an image of Far Rockaway Boardwalk after 
uh, Sandy, which was destroyed with a series of protective sand dunes. And uh, new larger dunes were put in place as a, quote, temporary fix to the situation, essentially separating the city from the water and providing the impression that water is something dangerous and to be feared. And these barrier dunes have more or less transformed the beach into a piece of infrastructure in service of protection. Uh, the ramifications of the hurricane have the potential to further disconnect the site from the water through mechanisms of flood mitigation. For us, instead of perceiving this water as something to defend against, we really question how it can be repositioned as a performative feature that connects across uh, different aspects of the site. Uh, currently, for those of you who know Long Island, there's these series of these groins, essentially breakwaters, approximately 150 feet apart to stabilize the land. And we asked, what if these were increased in size to allow the water in while still being protective? So taking the logic of the stabilizing rock jetties, this proposal utilizes a series of figures to augment the existing coastline to allow the water into the development, alleviating its pressure and stabilizing the island. A second set of figures carve into the land, um, into the coast to create connections between these disconnected layers and allow the water into the site yet controlling it. Each of these sets of figures coincide with measured storm heights, creating really a didactic legibility of the site's water level. Further, each set of figures provides different programmatic opportunities related to its form when it is revealed. So this is a, a plan of it. And I'm really just focusing on the public zones, which are the figures. There's a, a field of housing also in the project, um, which is the 1,500 units of housing. Uh, for us, this coastline, this new reinvented coastline, instead of a static and separated line, is reconceived as an accommodating landscape, activated by these different levels of water, which in site programs calibrated to seasonal and daily cycles. While some of these figures are clearly articulated, others accumulate passively over time, such as, for instance, the circular, does this show up here? Uh, not really. Uh, such as the circular cove, which would naturally form from the insertion of these breakwaters. So again, there's a play here between uh, setting up instruments in the water and allowing time to passively accumulate or carve sediment. Um, it's important to note that the surface here is positioned as this transforming uh, terrain that accommodates a diverse series of uses throughout the day, week, and season, depending on the tidal cycles and storm cycles. And so really here, there's an overlap between natural and human uses, which is managed and choreographed by the surface itself. And, and you know, more importantly, probably uh, adds, by adding these kind of figures, you get a legibility of the water levels or you know, the level between these water levels, which for us is a political act of engaging one in larger environmental systems. So the third approach we've examined is uh, what a, we've titled rewiring states. Rewiring states inserts architectural form in precise relationship to various states of time, temperature, materiality, and form, as well as processes, logistical, industrial, and infrastructural. These projects attempt to rewire these processes through leveraging how architecture can adapt, transform, and impact territorial organizations and add new socio-political actors to these systems. So the project I'll show here uh, was a competition proposal for dealing with sediment management in Toledo, Ohio. Um, is anyone from Toledo, Ohio? Oh, OK. Um, just curious. So this is an image of just outside Toledo. Um, for those of you that don't know Toledo or the surrounding geography very well, uh, Toledo um, and this Great Lakes system actually produce 3 million cubic yards of uh, dredge material each year. And with increasing ship size, decreasing water levels, and serious deficiencies in upland sediment management, this dredging operation is likely to continue indefinitely. So uh, out of that 3 million cubic um, yards I talked about, it's fascinating to note that one third of that comes from Toledo and the Maumee Bay, uh, just next to Toledo. Uh, mostly because of its shallow depth and the amount of um, operations in its port. Uh, Toledo currently ranks seventh in the Great Lakes in total tonnage in terms of its port, uh, moving approximately 11 million tons of cargo annually. So this competition was set up to look at three things, what to do with this dredge material and ask how it can do more for the city to reconsider stormwater management of the city and find ways to cohabit the riverfront with regional industry and public programming. 
Um, one of the first things that's noticeable, uh, which you can see on the map on the left, is that dredge material is currently tugged out of the city and dumped into Lake Erie. This disconnection between the downtown core of the city and the new land of the dredge makes this, and you know, the separation of space and, and you know, the amount of kind of, I think it's about uh, four mile separation, uh, really makes using this dredge as a public asset challenging. Secondly, it's impossible given just the sheer amount of this material to dump this in different parts of the river itself. So instead we looked at a, a process of dredge and dredge remediation which uses uh, geotubes. Again, this is not something we designed. We don't exert control on the design of this technology. It's something that's out there and generic and works quite well. But we've used it in a very different way. Uh, we fill these tubes with dredge and we've floated them onto the water to, pr pr to propose a series of temporary islands that could be in close proximity to the city. So the way this process works is that the dredge material is pumped into these tubes which are combined together to create a series of floating pontoons. During the dewatering stage, these pontoons are fitted with public platforms. So this is about a three month cycle where the water is dewatered from these tubes. This essentially allows the residents of the city to have access to the water in, in these intervals while dewatering is occurring below. Uh, these are some of the islands we envision, which are essentially made through a grouping of these modular rafts. Uh, the idea, however, is that really any island type or program can be accommodated by the users of the city, uh, depending on the time of year or the residents' wishes. These are iterative, um, and you know, in, in that way, they're very low stakes. You don't have to get it perfect. Uh, finally, once dewatering is complete, these geotubes are opened up and hydro-seeded and planted for remediating the dredge material itself, creating a series of floating wetlands. Um, because of the amount of dredge, scheduling the dredge, dewatering, public programming, and planting is critical. As a new series of islands is dispatched every month, new programs can be accommodated for based on seasonal events. This inserts a bottom-up tactical and iterative approach to forming public space within the geologics of the industrial system. So here you can see islands in closer proximity to the city where they can really be used as public amenities. So uh, really the kind of counter project to this is what we see in most cities, which is a continuous waterfront project. And, and that's actually, I think, what the competition organizers wanted. I think that's why they set this thing up. Um, but in fact, when you look at uh, the ownership of land in Toledo, it's highly industrial and highly productive uh, industrial land, and which, has, which is still being used and there's no kind of plans to stop using it. So we don't really see that form of urbanism uh, actually being able to occur here. We think it's a bit of a pipe dream. Um, instead, we actually propose that through these industrial lands, small easements are formed which create access points to these islands, and these easements also act as stormwater collection systems, bringing stormwater to these floating wetlands to be remediated before dispelled into the river. So the other aspect of this project uh, was looking at uh, what to do with stormwater management. The city of Toledo has been mandated to reduce its combined sewer overflow events by the EPA, inciting new scale of stormwater management projects. We examined how a series of smaller distributed wetlands could address the issue instead of a centralized hard gray water infrastructure that is currently being proposed. So one of the issues with stormwater management, as many of you know, is the distance between where a raindrop falls and where it eventually ends up. Uh, reducing that distance, in fact, reduces the amount of contaminants that that raindrop is going to gather along its route. For us, we actually looked at the number of foreclosed houses in this competition was 2014, and it's amazing if you add up the area of those front and backyards of those foreclosed houses, it equals about 85 acres of land, which is estimated to be the amount of land to remediate uh, the stormwater and really detain it so it can infiltrate more naturally back into the earth. Uh, so we actually uh, operationalized these kind of wading lands by using the remediated dredge in a form of sandbags to create curbs around these properties while they're waiting to be rebought or taken down uh, as a distributed way of dealing with a large problem. So this is one of the images of the uh, access tributaries. These are one of the easements that allow for connection back to these islands. This particular one is one of the larger ones. There's, very, there's two of these at this scale that are dealing with dredge and remediating dredge year long when the river is also frozen. 
Um, finally, one of the current issues of dumping this dredge material in Lake Erie is the creation of algae, which suppresses light penetration and is threatening the lake ecosystem. So you probably saw in that first image of Lake Erie, you're probably wondering what that green goo was spewing out of uh, Toledo. That's actually algae. And essentially, you know, the light that it's blocking is killing everything below it. Um, for us, we actually wanted to see how this dredge material, which is actually currently the problem and adding to the problem of algae, could be used as a solution. Um, so for us, once this sediment is remediated in this geotube and safe for open lake placement, the soil in the pontoons is mixed with the rare earth bentonite and water solution. And this solution actually acts as a natural sponge to suppress and absorb algae growth. So uh, essentially these sealed geotubes are tugged out into the bay where the slurry is distributed through the lake gradually to suppress and absorb algae growth. Over several years, this process is anticipated to return Lake Erie to its original nutrient composition. The empty geotune pontoons can either be reinserted into the dredge cycle or stored depending on the season. By inserting incremental materials into the geologics of dredge, territorial issues such as harmful algae blooms are addressed in an appropriate time scale, which can be iteratively calibrated to the specific ecologies of the lake. So the proposed geologics of dredge enable local environments and citizens, as well as territorial transformations to co-evolve with and through the dredge cycle. The expansion of beneficial uses that move beyond sediment repurposing to engage how the system of dredging itself can be a resource to cities and their ecologies, both locally and territorially, as well as in an immediate and geologic time frame, implicates new subjects into, once was, into what was once a top-down linear, linear and industrial system. In the context of mid-sized cities such as Toledo, where low land values, productive industry collide with uh, water and associated deprivity of public space are, uh, occur, a system of producing land in a malleable, temporal, and transformable uh, logic enables a symbiotic cohabitation of industry, culture, and ecology. This positions land not as a commodity to capture and hold, but rather as a temporal material state that is iteratively deployed and used by local constituents and then redistributed to a territorial ecology. Within this expanded geologics, culture, politics, economics, and ecology find synergetic opportunities that empower these new subjects to be agents into a top-down engineered system of capital. So finally, uh, the fourth category is what we're calling the living archive, and this is associated with an approach to experimental history. Uh, this category questions and critiques and formats permanent forms of historical readings by inserting the contemporary subject into the making of the archive. These inherently political projects address the tension between the permanent archive and the temporal subjective understandings of knowledge by reframing our perception of permanence and origin through new approaches to archetypal form, structure, heaviness, power, and stability. So this uh, final project I wanna show is a proposal for a temporary garden installation, uh, which was also our inspiration for the exhibition here. And this project looks at the uh, idea and issue of invasive species. Uh, the project is cited in Canada. Um, invasive species are essentially species that were introduced and now, you know, kind of take over certain ecologies. In Canada right now, there's about 486 invasive plant species. And many of these were introduced during the colonization period of the 1800s for ornamental purposes, essentially to create gardens. Ironically, it is the success of these plants in flourishing in these non-native environments that now makes them a threat. Simultaneously, several of these alien plants have resided in Canada longer than Canada's own formation in 1867, making them effectively more Canadian than Canada itself. Um, our proposal produces a living archive of 22 of the earliest invasive plant species brought to Canada that were intentionally introduced for their beauty. Organized within a tensile portico structure, uh, each of these species is allowed to hover behind a transparent veil, and the species are separated from the ground where they could pose a threat. As the festival continues throughout the summer, these plants will develop, and their weight will essentially pull them closer to the earth, the tension of the flexible portico aligning with the tension of the approaching species. So that's, uh, this is just an image, uh, very simple elevation of what looks to be a very monumental form, but is more or less made through a transparent and dematerialized veil. And this is a, a view 
at the beginning of the festival where each of the species is calibrated to be the same weight and thus uh, produce the same tension on the overall structure. This balancing act of tension is negotiated uh, with each individual unit acting on the whole as the entire structural system is created from interconnected tensile members. The structure is distorted by both the plants as well as human occupation, pushing and pulling on the modules by users, balancing environmental and social transformations. This is a planting plan uh, with the sort of worm's eye view that essentially ranges these species as a timeline along the portico. And essentially, you know, the scheme is trying to produce this interactive installation that attempts to merge art with ecology and politics. Um, through the structure itself, you can learn more about the qualities of these species through their soil and water retention, how fast they're growing and so forth. Um, but essentially, we're, what we're trying to do here is frame the tension between invasive and natives, which makes it a part art critique of culture as well as part garden critique of nature. And in a larger way, um, is a bit of a critique on you know, questions of xenophobia and immigration that we're all confronting today. So presented in the gallery, um, just here is a series of taxonomy drawings relating to each of these techniques, which we see as being the first uh, chapter in our office's development. Thank you. Okay, so our third and last presentation this evening features the work of Hubert Peltier and Yves de Fontenay. Peltier de Fontenay was established in Montreal, Canada in 2010 after both partners worked in architecture offices in Canada and the United States as well as in the fields of industrial design and fine art. Hubert Peltier studied industrial design at the University of Montreal and at the ENSCI in Paris. Uh, he received his Master and Bachelor of Architecture degrees from the University of Montreal. Yves de Fontenay studied at the Federal Polytechnic School of Lausanne and uh, received his Master and Bachelor of Architecture degrees from the University of Montreal as well. Both Hubert and Yves currently teach at the University of Montreal and the McGill School of Architecture in Canada. In their submission, they wrote that they were interested in which ideas in architecture transcend time and described a process of looking at past architectural models and studying which forms, structures, and organizations recur throughout time. It is these invariants, as they call them, which they perceive as permanent. We welcome Iber and Eve. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Yves de Fontenay. Hubert uh, It's really a privilege uh, to be among this year's League Prize winners this year. Um, we'd obviously like to thank the, uh, the Architectural League, especially, and um, Matt and Martha for organizing the exhibition also. We'd also like to thank the jury for selecting us. Uh, <laughs> we'd uh, especially like to thank also the Quebec Arts Council who uh, helped us kickstart this project that we're gonna be showing. Um, and finally, also a special thanks to all the friends and the staff, uh, especially Yann Gekrosier and uh, Nicolas Muche, who, uh, who helped us uh, with this project over the last uh, four or five years. I'll let you both start with the presentation. Yeah, so tonight we will try to address the, th the theme of permanence and permanence uh, in our work, but also since this prize is for emerging architects, we thought it would be interesting to also speak about emergence and uh, how we dealt with the condition of beginning as, uh, as, our, as an architect. Um, we will present uh, a research project very important to us called Invariations that started all the way back in 2010 and that spanned the, the entire five, six years uh, now that since we've established Pensier de Fontenay. So up to now, this project was a kind of work in progress that ran more or less in parallel to uh, our more traditional client-based practice. But the application to the League Prize uh, forced us to, to examine uh, both strand of our practice uh, under the, the same theme, permanence and permanence, and which is something that we have never really examined before because we always thought that 
this was more like a, a research exercise and we're running the, the practice um, on, in parallel. So emergence. This is a picture from 1966 taken in, uh, taken in Rome. We, and, and there we see a young Richard Serra, 27 years old, in his zoo period. Uh, and at this time, he was experimenting with a bunch of things in material, and among them, live and stuffed animal. So we think this image is very interesting because it represents this uncertainty about one's work and where it's going to lead. Um, and while some pieces of the same period, such as doors and through pieces, look very prescient now that we know what he's doing uh, in, in regard of his actual production, Live Pig Cage One is definitely an aborted strand of his work, <laughs> very far from what his practice would eventually become. So this image of Richard Serra feeding a pig embodies for us, on one end, this state of confusion and uncertainty about, uh, that is typical of young creatives and about what they are hoping to do in their fields. Uh, and on the other end, we find it very inspiring. Uh, we, we find inspiring this willingness to experiment and potentially fail, obviously, before finding your own way into creation. And to us, it represents, in a way, where we were back in 2010, like where to start. And the answer really was anywhere, because in the end, you just need to get started. So shortly after this, this is Rome exhibition, Sarah wrote down his seminal verb list, a list of actions to be performed on different materials. Quote, I wanted to enact the verb without thinking, in relation to material without thinking about their ends or their conclusions, without having to define them in terms of art, but to involve myself in a process of making. And this is really a, a, a phrase that stuck uh, to us, involve ourselves in the process of making. And Sarah gave himself an experimental program, a repetitive exercise to get things going and actually have something on the table to reflect on, having the confidence that the process will lead him somewhere he can't foresee a priori. So to cut, to prop, to lift, to splash, to roll. I would buy a sheet of lead, unroll it, and roll it back up. Now, for anybody coming in, it could have looked nonsensical. But at some point, if you want to get down to zero, you have to start from scratch. This is Richard Serra saying this. So back in 2010, we were in the same position, starting from scratch, uh, really standing on the clean slate. We had just had left our job. We had no clients, no projects, no teaching position. I'm sure a lot of you were in the same position at, at some point. But we needed to work on a project that would get us going. Right. So really having no clear idea of what our architecture would really be about. Um, and it felt impossible for us to clarify this in a theoretical manner. Uh, and so we felt it was really important to act first and then reflect upon what we did in a make-think feedback loop. Um, so we thought we needed an exploration program much like Sarah's verb list, only um, on one hand, we needed to do this project definitely the, the, sorry, we needed to do this project differently than the way we did things in school. Uh, our school experience and our, our training in school was, was almost a, always about uh, a fictional context, working with fictional sites, fictional narratives, fictional programs. Um, so on the other hand, though, we really want to start from scratch. If we really want to start from scratch, sorry, we, we needed to get down to the zeros that Sarah was talking about earlier. So we need to strip the architecture from all its complexity, from all the politics, from all the variables, you know, to bring it down to the basic, it really a simplified condition. So this idea triggered a series of interesting questions. What happens when you remove everything that's contextual in architecture? Is there anything left? You know? When you remove all the variables from the architectural project, again, no site, no program, no client, no narrative, no budget, no regulations, no social context, no political climate, is there anything left to hold on to? Can architecture still operate without any external factors, with only its in her, in, internal coherence? Can it operate only from within? So we stripped it down to, stripped down the architectural project from the aspects that, we, that vary, and we, we, we made a list of constant things that, 
constantly exist, that always exist regardless of the project conditions. So we ended up isolating the following five parameters, form, structure, movement, proportion, and light. And we thought that these five criteria are really what separate an architectural exploration from a merely formal or sculptural exploration. We ended up calling these constants the invariants of the architectural project, hence the title of the research project, Invariations. So really summing it up in a sentence, here was our program. We needed to generate hollow forms that would credibly hold up against gravity, be penetrated by light, and in which one's body could move and relate proportionally. So, the question was, how do we shape the invariants? What, we came back to the idea of process as a way to generate something out of nothing, uh, something that would, we cannot necessarily foresee. And uh, in our case, instead of using verbs, we relied mostly on geometric operations. I'll explain here two examples of these operational sequences. In, vari in, in variation one is the first prototype that emerged out of our explorations. So we would start with basic 2D geometries, lines, grids, or sets of points. And the geometry itself was not really important. It was really more of a port point of departure for, for testing ideas. In this case, what we were interested in was the idea of randomness. And so we started by placing a series of points randomly within a square. We then drew a triangular grid within, by linking all the random points within the square. A second denser pattern was drawn by subdividing each initial triangle in three smaller triangles within it. The first set of points was connected by a series of arches, columns and arches, all of which had the same base point and the same apex. And we then extruded each arch perpendicularly, and the intersection lines corresponded directly with the second subdivided triangular grid. So the result is this complex series of intersecting vaults. Every single vault is different from one another. So we had this idea at the beginning that the geometric process was going to be a really objective and rigorous thing, but we progressively realized that we were constantly mapping and projecting our own architectural ideas onto these abstract geometries. And that was really the only way to make it move forward, the only way to make a decision about the next step to be taken. So in this case, the classical form of the vault came to us because we thought it'd be interesting to oppose it to that idea of randomness. So this duality is really what drove this prototype forward, trying to find a coherent balance between both those ideas, the grid or the vault and, and the random grid. So. Here we see a, a plan view of what this prototype gave. An elevation view. And an axometric view. So I'm just going to present a second <coughs> in variation or uh, operational sequence. Um, so this is in variation two, the second prototype we developed. Um, so we first drew a lattice that was drawn with uh, two misaligned patterns. We then defined rectangles angered on intersection points of the grid, so four rectangles. So at some point, we would move from 2D to 3D, and we continue to complexify the model and make it evolve. Uh, a first series of rectangular bars were extruded along the rectangles we first drew. And then a second series of rectangular bars was extruded over the, over the first series of bars. Um, along the second grid that we drew. So the multiple points of intersection between these two layers link the previously, they link the, 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 the bars that were previously separated by, by, by voids together. And, and in this case, yeah, sorry, and we automatically read the opportunity um, to, to, to link these very abstract geometries. And, and in this case, we were fascinating with the idea of, of, of separate yet interconnected volumes, and this idea of this three-dimensional lattice. So the resulting weave allowed for multiple paths to be used to travel through the space. It created an interconnected system. 
And the last step was to make various openings at different intersecting faces to bring light into the system. So of course, the sequences we're showing you now are, like Naraj said earlier, uh, post-rationalized versions of the actual process uh, that we made after the prototypes were fully developed. I mean, the reality was obviously extremely chaotic and a lot more messy with numerous back and forth discussions, sketches, and study models. So here's the plan of that prototype, the elevation, and the axometric view. So Eve just presented an overview of the iterative process for the first two invariations. But over the course of the last six years, we went through these manipulations for tens of different versions. Uh, most of them abandon, uh, like it's always the case in any creative process. But in the end, we developed nine different models that we felt brought together all the five invariants in a coherent whole and that we felt were worth the, the, the effort of bringing all the way up to the, their conclusions. So I'll, uh, I'll quickly present each of them uh, in the chronological order that they were, uh, they were designed, but really like a, a quick survey of, of all of them. So in variation one. So as we discussed earlier, in variation one was about the encounter of a classical form with a random organization. And of course, the vault is supercharged with historical, symbolical, and affective meanings. But in the context of this exercise, we were taking a step back, looking, it from, uh, looking at it from a distance, and using it for its specific formal, spatial, and structural aspects. It doesn't mean that we're not interested in the, the, the history of, of it, but that in this case, it was really more uh, a spatial device. In variation two, the subject was the weaving of the external and internal space and the creation of a spatial sequence where you have to go up and down and up and down to move around uh, the space. And Again, like, in, like with the vault, the, the kind of figure of the, the pitched roof was sort of imposed itself in a way to, to, to go from the abstraction of geometry to, to, to make this geometry enter the realm of architecture. And we, since we were not operating in a, in a context or in an in a urban context, we had we only the, the, the history of architecture and the history of form and this kind of reservoir imaginaire of form to kind of go forward in this process. In variation three, and we were exploring in this model the idea of the structural skin and how the pentagonal shape could be used to explore the question of depth of the structure and the corner conditions. We, and we looked at the paradox of the delamination of the structure, uh, creating this kind of in-between vertical space in the stacked system. In variation four, based on the cellular plan, this model was about exploring the enfilade as a spatial sequence. Each cell is connected to the other directly without spaces specifically used for circulation. And the geometry created this opportunity to create openings in the, the roof triangulation uh, that, we, that we created in order to bring bounce light from the adjacent roof. And we see this kind of spa spatial layering that the cellular component was creating as an opportunity, a design opportunity. In variation five, this was about an in-between condition oscillation between two identities, the barrel vault and the mushroom column and slab system. And both conditions uh, are produced by the same geometric operation, which was cutting vaulted shape out of the solid block from two different angles. And when we were selecting where we would stop these extrusions, it would produce basically either a barrel vault that would be continuous with a, a continuous wall or a column that was just the, the slice of matter left in place as the structure. Here we see both condition. And 
these, of, of course, these beautiful kind of uh, lines into space, this kind of uh, landscape of, of intersecting lines in the ceilingscape. In variation six, um, there we were exploring the idea of the cantilever with the very minimal vertical support. And the shift shifting slabs uh, are superimposing in the center, uh, closer to the columns, offering a, a thickening of the structure that was allowing the structural feet. And the ribbing of the slab is both what makes the structure uh, hold up and the organization of space, because we organized them in a kind of pin pinwheel fashion. And with the receding planes, we're creating all these kind of sub, uh, sub organization in the slab and, and therefore in the space, because they were so strong. In variation seven, much like in variation five, this is an exploration on an ambiguous condition between, this time, domes and columns. Domes are carved out of a solid block with very little material left, creating more of a, a, lineament, uh, a, a linear structure than an actual domed space. But st still, from close up, you can kind of recompose the dome figure uh, from the, the, the lines into space. In variation eight, the question for this one was, how to generate a circular plan while avoiding the re regular radial structure. By putting the same number of posts inside and outside the figure, we had to, at some point, merge structural points and propose a new kind of shifted beam, beams organization. And the structure resulting uh, is what gives th this kind of dynamic expression to an otherwise uh, very stable, basic form, very basic condition. In variation nine, uh, the last one, exploring the idea of the clear span building. So three parallel grids are superimposed in a way that define intersection points that uh, are used for the vertical support at the periphery. So the dense structure filters light, it actually becomes the, the kind of ornamental uh, background of the space. So when we thought about this year team's impermanence, we quickly understood what mattered uh, the most to us was the permanence of idea. We've become more and more fascinated with the recurrence of certain forms, structure, or organization through time. And so we tried to understand which structuring concept and archetype shape our work and which one kept reemerging, consciously or not, in both our research and our projects. And so we did a kind of retros introspective exercise of trying to group projects in, team, uh, in teams, projects that share common ideas and transcend times. Like Yuval said, we did this kind of introspective exercise where we wanted to uh, look through all our work so far, both the research work and, and, and the client-based work, and, uh, and, and, and find these common themes, find these common ideas that, 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 can be really, that are common ideas that we've seen through, throughout history. So here's what we came up with. And you'll see we're, we're going to be going really fast through these projects without kind of going into the details. Because uh, we really just want to illustrate the, the reoccurrence of, of those concepts. So it's kind of like speed dating through our portfolio. So the first, the first concept that we noticed kept reappearing uh, is the inner void. So just even in the invariations, uh, we used it in three of the different models, the prototypes. So obviously it's a spatial model that's been around forever. Uh, examples like the Roman Insula or even the Renaissance Palazzo. Um, so in, in this prototype, the radial concentric, concentric nature of the geometry we were exploring almost naturally imposed the idea of the inner void. And often that's what happened in, 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 in the, the prototypes of, um, of the Invariations Project. But in our client-based work, we noticed it also reoccurring a lot. So I'm really quickly going to go through a few office projects that uh, worked with this concept. This first one is uh, a campus project for an office campus project. Um, it's in an industrial area in Montreal. And uh, here we use the inner void as 
as a way to break down the, the different office programs into separate buildings, but to reconnect them within the central inner courtyard. And because of the context, the, the urban context, it, this was a tool to really just isolate and kind of uh, introvert the project and create a distance between this industrial part of the city and this kind of office island project. Here we just see an axiometric view, perspective view of the inner courtyard. Again, in a, this second project, it's a competition project for an opera house in Pusan, Korea. Um, the program called for three separate performance halls, uh, a small one, a medium one, and a large one. Uh, and our answer was to link these halls from below and from above the ground plane while keeping a central common open courtyard. So we show that in the diagram. So the openings to this courtyard corresponded with different access paths from, 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 from the sites, the surrounding site. And here we see an axonometric view. Third project, a residential master plan where we use the inner void as a way to circulate through the blocks along an internal balcony system. Oops, sorry. This is for a private house uh, where the, the, the void was formed by connecting four different rooms in an enfilade, in an enfilade sequence, uh, eliminating all the corridors. And it was all based around this square courtyard. And so the, the courtyard became kind of a buffer space between the rooms. The, 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 the square angle, or the square shape created these, these uh, rapprochements, sorry, these, uh, these, Narrow. connect, these narrowings between the rooms to organize the space. But again, you know, the courtyard and the inner void is central to the concept. Another project, fine, I think this is the last one with the inner voids. Uh, and this project is for a lighthouse on the site of the Co uh, Costa Concordia wreckage in Italy. And the central void was used here as a symbol of the loss that happened at that specific location. And so we started with just the simple diagram, the ring. And that ring shape naturally lent itself to the idea of a circular uh, central staircase. And so this, we use this double helix staircase running along the interior perimeter of the structure so that visitors, visitors would naturally circulate up and then gradually down the structure. So the helix-shaped staircase in a way resembled a water vortex, and, um, which is another strong symbol for the site. So the inherent qualities in that geometry uh, and in the movement of the, the helix form present in that staircase is what then drove the form of the rest of the structure, which you'll see later in another family. So this is the second family, the shed or pitched roof. Um, so it's this archetypal form that kept reappearing in our, in our work again. Um, this form is obviously refers to the, you know, the, the origins of architecture, in part because of its inherent and just structural and, and functional qualities. So, um, to the invariants that you just saw. So in the house we showed you earlier, Uroboros house, each one of the rooms, each one of the four volumes has a distinct shed-like profile that all connect uh, to one another in that central rectangular courtyard. Another view of the house. In this project, uh, for a glass pavilion at Montreal Botanical Garden, um, the shed form is used as a mechanism to control light and the views inside the space. Uh, here, the shed form, it echoes more the industrial shed than the typical architectural house shed. And what's particular in this project is that we use the pleated geometry of the shed that we would commonly see for different industrial, you know, train yards, for example, but not only on the roof, but also on the facades, on two of the sides of the building. We'll come back to it in another family. So finally, uh, a third project for uh, a beach in a suburban neighborhood in Montreal, just outside Montreal. So all the homes, this is a typical kind of North American suburban area where all the homes in the era were mostly 60s constructions with 
very low pitched roofs. So we reuse that form and that geometry both for the floating pavilion and the different docks uh, that were adjacent. So the project was to bring the visitors out into the river and outside of the beach to look back kind of at the city. And in the summer it would open up and in the winter it would close itself. Third family, fourth family. The, uh, the third grouping, sorry, is structure. But here it's the idea of bared down expression of structure where the exposed structural elements actually make the space and organize the space in certain cases. So again, in three of the invariations, st strong presence of this exposed structures. They all heavily rely on, on, on structure to define and contain the space. So in th this is our second project um, we ever did was a competition for the Holocaust, uh, for a ho Holocaust Memorial at Atlantic City. And the structure is used here to express the immense weight of the losses that occurred during the Holocaust. And so the thinning concrete columns, the beams, sorry, concrete beams that sit, they sit above these reflective glass walls and allow us to see the sky once inside the pavilion versus when we're outside of the pavilion, it just looks like a massive, a heavy mass. Here in a apartment renovation where we see that the, we use the structuring, the, the supporting structure that we use to support the upper floors and we left it exposed and even highlighted it just to actually organize the space and it's really what organized the different living areas between or divided the different living areas. Again, the Costco Concordia Lighthouse, where the structure is really used as a singular, all-encompassing element. You know, there's essentially nothing else present, only that structure. And again, the glass pavilion in which we, like I said before, expose the structure to shape the facades and the space inside the entire skin of the building. And, the, and, and here, like I said, the structure becomes kind of a tool uh, to control the light and the views outside towards the garden. And it's kind of like stripping down layers, bringing it back to its almost most basic condition. And finally, the last family is vaults and domes that we identified. Obviously, uh, the reoccurrence of the vault and the dome in the Invariations Project again. So even if we weren't aiming at the beginning of the research project to work with vaults, the form sort of sneaked in on the process uh, as a strong geometry because it was charged with both this formal complexity but also this evocative power. So as Jabal explained earlier, um, we were mostly interested in seeing how we could confront these classical geometries with less rigid grids and, and free them from their, let's say, more traditional regularity. And so after the first prototype, we continued to play with these forms, this time more deliberately. And variation fives is exploring more of the barrel vault and column aspect, like Val mentioned. And variation seven is more the explanation of the classic dome. And lastly, the strange thing is that even if we were interested in exploring these classical geometries, we never planned on using them or seeing them appear in our own work or in our own practice. Um, but the dome, a pu the purest form of the dome, reappeared recently in one of our projects, uh, the Insectarium Project in Montreal, which we're currently working on. Um, so it's an insect museum uh, that has both live insects and 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 a series of, of perceptual spaces and this huge collection. So in this case, we use the dome in a very special moment in the museum experience where the visitors get to see this immense um, insect collection. And we felt, you know, it deserved this, this, this moment deserved this singular powerful space. And What's funny in this project is the dome is used in complete opposition with the rest of the building, which is almost entirely underground or made up of production greenhouses for plants and insects. I'll let you bow. Finish off.
Yeah, so these direct links between research and practice were never fully anticipated from the beginning. And variation was always thought as an exercise running in parallel, not so different from the nice nine square grid exercise John Eshdok was giving the students at Cooper Union. We always saw it as a form of training, like going to the gym, practicing scales. Um, and variation was about exploring autonomy in architecture. And this is actually very much in contrast with our actual client-based practice, which is so heavily uh, contextually driven. And this contra contrast is fundamental because to us, the ideal outcome is when a project is simultaneously capable of fulfilling the program and improving the context while remaining coherent as a, an autonomous object. Thanks.